so from Edge Environment. Uh, really exciting day today to be able to share with you some of the updates with the tree planting predictor. Uh, as you'll hear as we go along, this is something we've been working on for a number of years, and it's it's really been driven out of discussions we've had with a lot of people who are very passionate about how we green our cities. And as I'm sure everyone is joining in today will recognise, this is something that's uh, becoming of increasing importance right around the world is how we green our cities. Um, before we get underway though, I'd just like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands from wherever you're coming to from us today. I'm joining you from Ghana land, uh, which the traditional owners, uh, who are the traditional owners of the Adelaide Plains, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So what Jenny and I are gonna do is a little bit of tag team throughout the, the session here this morning. Jenny's gonna help set the scene as to what we see as some of the drivers around uh, urban greening, and I'm sure much of that will resonate with all of you. And then we're gonna spend a little bit of time unpacking what the tree planting predictor can do, what the functionality is of the free version, which is available on the EDGE website. And then we'll also have a look at the professional version and outline some of the insights you can get from that. So without any further ado, Jenny, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Mark. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to start off by quickly running through a bit of a, a context, get everyone on the same page. I'm sure none of what we're about to talk about in these initial few slides will be new to, to you, but just to make sure we're all you know, right on the same page. So. Um, there's the most recent global trend we've seen um, in the livable cities area is this, this goal of, of creating this really balanced sort of urban environment um, that makes them resilient and livable, not just for people, but, but for local economies and, and for the environment as well. Um, Mark, if you click forward. Um, and one of the, the key mechanisms um, that have been identified to help achieve livable cities is um, growing our urban forests, so increasing the number of trees and the amount of canopy cover and generally the amount of green space, but trees are definitely identified as a key mechanism because of the huge range of benefits that they provide for um, not only people, our, our sort of health and mental and physical health and well-being, but also for local economies and for the environment um, as well in terms of um, adapting to heat and, and climate change impacts and biodiversity as well. Um, this has been recognised, sorry Mark, to stay on that one, by a number of um, national leading organisations such as the World Health Organisation, um, the United Nations um, FAO, and also leading national organisations such as in Australia, um, our Heart Foundation. So what we find on the next slide, Mark, is that there's um, now this really growing movement um, amongst cities across the world to demonstrate their commitment to, to growing the urban forest. And this is um, really clearly shown um, by the growing number of cities that are being recognized as certified tree cities of the world. And to be a tree city of the world, you need to demonstrate that you've met five core criteria, which relate to um, having policies around your tree management, having targets for growing your trees, um, having set, um, set policies and, and structures for, for managing and also um, ways to engage your community around trees. So um, the latest count, the 2020 count was 120 recognised cities um, across 23 countries. Um, and so this really shows that cities are really driving um, this push to, to green our urban environments. And if you have a look at the next slide, this has been recognised um, in the COP26 as well that it's cities, not countries, that are really driving the conversation around adapting to climate change and, and creating more resilient um, areas for people and the environment. Um, so what we found is that one of the first things that cities will do on the next slide is go ahead and, and set their canopy cover target. This is their first way of demonstrating that, yes, they're committing to growing the urban forest. We'll set our canopy cover target. And these are often quite ambitious. So um, for example, you see um, Melbourne and Sydney there in Australia um, are proposing to roughly double their canopy cover um, within the next 20 years. Um, but if you have a look right at the bottom, Kampala Capital City Authority in Uganda, which is one of the newest um, recognised tree cities of the world, is proposing to double their canopy cover within the next five years. 
So there are some really quite ambitious targets out there, which is admirable. But then we find um, when it comes to implementation, there can be some challenges. So on the next slide, we find very common challenges um, across land managers that we've talked to and worked with, um, regardless of whether you're here in Australia or you're in the US or the UK or Africa, America, New Zealand, there are very common um, challenges faced after you set these ambitious targets. Um, when it comes to implementation, people start asking questions, well, how many trees do we actually need to plant to achieve that canopy cover target? And well, what, what species should we be planting? What mix of trees should we be planting? And do we actually have enough space available to plant the number of trees we need to, to reach the targets? And what's it actually going to cost realistically? And then finally, how do we get support both internally from our elected members, but also externally from our community to grow our urban forest? Um, so these are some of the, the key challenges that we've heard repeated over and over. And what we realised then, um, some years ago now, when we started down this journey of the tree planting predictor, is that there was a real need for an evidence base. If you click the next, yep, um, to, to help, oops, back one. <laughs> um, there's this real need for an evidence base to help really justify the canopy cover targets as being realistic and also set that, I guess, that roadmap, um, which is now a common term in all of our vocabs, thanks to COVID, but, but set the roadmap of how um, we're going to achieve those canopy cover targets. And this um, evidence base really is critical for leveraging that internal and external support, but also um, achieving the funding that's needed or justifying the funding needed. Mark, over to you. Thanks, Jenny. And I've just noticed I'm working from a booth here with a light sensor, which has been very inefficient and has turned the light off. So I'm going to keep uh, rolling and then wave my hand around a little bit later on. Um, but so that really leads us into the tree planting predictor and what we've tried to achieve with this. And it's an interesting backstory around this. So Jenny and I have been working around urban forest strategies and really, as Jenny said, building the business case for more greening in our cities. We've been working on that for at least the last five or six years in a dedicated way. Um, a couple of years ago, though, we had a discussion with a council who were writing an urban forest strategy for, and they wanted to set a very ambitious target, much along the lines of what Jenny's been discussing. And I remember in a meeting with some elected members, they said, well, look, we want to set a target of 30% canopy cover. And one of the elected members said, well, how many trees is that going to take to get there? And what's it going to cost us? Uh, and I'll put my hand up and said, oh, that's pretty straightforward. I'll get back to you next week with the answer. Um, and of course, some of you are probably laughing at that because you realise it's not that simple to do. In fact, there are a whole range of different factors that need to be considered, not just the number of trees that are planted, but the different species that are planted, how big those trees are, how quickly do they grow, are they watered, are they not watered? So there's a range of different factors that need to come together. And that's where the very beginnings of the tree planting predictor were born. Basically, a series of formulas that started to be developed in an Excel sheet and two years later now, we've got a fully blown professional and light version of the tree planting predictor. Broadly, the objective of the tree planting predictor is to provide that ev evidence base for achievable canopy covered targets. Uh, you know, Jenny and I and others at EDGE, and I know across everyone working in this industry knows that it's not good enough anymore just to have uh, broad, ambitious targets that need to be grounded in an evidence base and also need to be linked with the cost of achieving them. Uh, and it was put to me by but one council, for example, who we're working with is they had concerns around, are we actually including the right uh, resources as in dollars in our long-term financial plans to be able to back up the quite ambitious canopy cover targets that we have? And so that's really where the tree planting predictor comes is to build that evidence base. One of the things we do is in the tool is we explore planting program scenarios. And effectively a scenario is where we've got a species mix combined with the number of trees planted per year and then a consideration whether irrigation is or isn't happening. And specifically the type of outputs we're looking at is what's a future achievable canopy cover target. So compared to what the, the target might be that's been set, what's actually achievable, what's the cost of getting there, some consideration of the benefits of irrigation or no irrigation, but also the impact of different species mixes. So I'm going to hand back over to Jenny now to talk through the different inputs for tree planting predictor, and then I'll come back to step us through a case study. 
Uh, you're on mute there, Jenny. Thanks. Um, so when we run um, the tree planning predictor, there's seven main inputs that we like to have available. Um, so the first is, what's your current canopy cover? So in order to, to model and, and figure out whether you're actually going to be able to achieve a canopy cover target, we need to know where we're starting at. So what's the current canopy? And then what is the canopy cover target you're trying to achieve? Well, potentially there might be two or three targets that you're investigating. So you might not have actually set a target yet, but you might say, well, we want to investigate a few different targets. Um, the second input then is what's your area of interest? So we need to define um, that area within which you're trying to achieve your canopy cover targets. The third input is having a look at tree growth parameters and planting mix. So what this means is how do certain trees grow in your specific context? So one of the really nice things about the tree planting predictor is that it's fully customizable for your um, local context. And we work with the local arboricultural or horticultural team to, to really define these tree growth parameters within your context. And then what's the planting mix? And Mark will talk a bit more about that later on, but that's really talking about um, the mix of smaller canopy um, right up to very large canopy trees. Um, the third, or oh, sorry, the fourth input is an understanding of what your current establishment success is of existing planting. So most land managers will have an understanding of how successful um, their planting programs currently are. So it might be that you know, you get a 95% um, establishment success, for example. Um, and that's also why it's really important that we have this input from the local land manager, um, our boricultural team. Um, the fifth input is what's the rate of loss? So what we want to know is, is how much of your existing canopy is currently being lost over time. And that could be due to tree senescence or storm damage, but more often than not in urban areas, it's because of urban infill. So an understanding of how, um, what the rate of loss is of your current canopy helps us to project um, how feasible it is that you'll reach future canopy cover targets. Uh, the sixth input is then, as we've discussed, whether you're going to be irrigating or not. Um, and obviously that has impacts on how fast a tree can grow. Um, and then the final input is looking at your establishment costs. So this is really an understanding of how much does it cost you on average to plant a tree and manage that tree, usually for the first two or three years of establishment. Great, uh, thanks Jenny. So we've obviously covered off on the inputs there and some of those inputs are um, easy to attain. Some will come from expert knowledge from within your individual organization. Um, other, some of those other types of information, particularly current canopy, there's a range of different ways that that data can be pulled together. You could be using iTree Canopy, or you may be using LiDAR derived um, estimates of canopy. Either way, there's lots of different sources of this type of information. So um, just having a little bit more of a look now at the tree planted predictor and how it's put together. It is based in an Excel uh, sheet. So it's an Excel based tool. We are currently looking at making it a fully enabled web based tool. But really the key features is there's a front end dashboard, particularly for the professional version, um, which is available for use. And that has all of those input data that Jenny's just described, that can be manipulated. And then there's a series of back end calculations. And I was going through again, recapping as we're, we're now in version two of the professional version. And it's currently over 500,000 equations that are sitting in the back end of the tool, which enable us to do the type of analyses that are, are important. Um, one of the key parts of the analysis comes to how do we factor in the fact that different trees, different species of trees grow in different ways. And we know, and everyone listening around this call, I'm sure will be aware of, we've got smaller trees that can grow quickly, uh, but they might only get a small canopy and they perhaps don't live for very long versus larger trees that can take longer to grow. They need more space, but ultimately generate a much bigger canopy. So there's different species of trees. Then what we also know is that for any given species, they're gonna go quite differently depending on the area that they're growing in. So 
a jacaranda growing in Auckland, for example, might have a different growth rate than a jacaranda growing in Adelaide um, compared with a jacaranda perhaps growing in a more of a semi-arid area. So the growth rates will be quite different. So when we started to unpack the tree planting predictor, this was a key issue uh, to tackle. And Jenny's already mentioned the tree growth parameters. And the way that we've attacked this is by using what are called multi, uh, multi-partite S-shaped curves. And effectively that breaks down the different features of the growth of trees into parameters that we can manipulate. And effectively we manipulate that for five categories of trees. One is our small category of tree. In that case there, we've got a, a crepe myrtle, which I see a lot of those popping up in street sides now. Uh, a category B tree is something a little bit larger, small to medium tree. In an Australian context, it could be something like a clistamen. Um, a category C tree is what we class as a medium sized tree. So perhaps something up to eight to 10 meters in height. In Australia context, it could be a yellow gum or in New Zealand, it might be something like a coastal uh, mare. In category D tree, we've got an example here of that's not a yellow gum. Uh, it's almost like the in, in presentation quiz. That's a Norfolk Island pine, as I'm sure everyone will know. And then we've got a rata, uh, common in New Zealand. And then category might be a Morton Bay fig. But the key point there is that the way the tree planting predictor works is that it has assumptions around the growth parameters for these different categories of trees. However, what's really important is that through the way the tool is applied, we then customize those growth parameters for your given location. And the way we've done this to date, and Jenny's already made mention of this, is we'll work with uh, local agricultural teams or horticulture teams or open space planners or, or others who've really got an in-depth knowledge of what are the different categories or types of trees that are growing in their area and then how are they responding to the local climate. And also what's the difference between irrigating those trees versus not irrigating them. So they're the range of different factors that we can uh, that we account for. And importantly, customization of the tool is something that happens as it's being delivered. So what we're going to do now is step through a hypothetical example of the city of Greenway, which uh, Jenny's even come up with a, a neat logo here for the city of Greenway. So this is a fictitious, uh, fictitious uh, council area. Um, but let's just talk through how it's set up. So uh, it's a city of Greenway is a major urban capital with a population of one and a half million people that's rapidly growing. And like many cities around the world, they're trying to get this balance right between sustainable and resilient urban growth. And then how do they also adapt to climate change while also ensuring that they have biodiversity conservation in place? Um, they see in the city of Greenway, the urban forest is really important for achieve, uh, helping to achieve that balance between social, economic and environmental outcomes. Now, we also know that they're under growing internal e external pressure to act, that is the city of Greenway. And they've set what's potentially quite ambitious target of a 30% canopy cover by 2030. But one of the challenges that they have is that planting strategies have a real lack of clarity. And what they really want to know is how many trees do they need to plant each year to achieve their future canopy cover targets. This is the exact sort of thing that the tree planting predictor can help with. So a bit of a recap, and obviously there'll be a recording of this uh, presentation, so you can come back and have a look at the input variables. But this is the input data that we've used for city of um, uh, Greenway. It says Greensville, it should actually be uh, Greenway. Um, <laughs> I think that was mine actually. Um, so we've got three different canopy cover targets here. So we've got 25, 30 and 35%. 30% is what they are looking at achieving. But when Jenny and I run scenarios with the tree planting predictor, we always like to have some um, targets either side of the main target just to help with some sensitivity testing. We've got a current area of 65 square kilometres. Now importantly, their current canopy cover is 19.8%. That's really significant because it says they've got a fair bit of work to do even to get to 25%, let alone 30% or 35%. And I won't read through too many of the other input variables. I'll let you have a look at those. The establishment cost is a really interesting feature. We find that with a lot of organisations we've worked with, typically their establishment costs range from $510, $520 a tree up into the mid 600s. However, we do know, for example, if you're looking at using strata cells in the middle of cities, you could be looking at anywhere up to $10,000 for those trees. So the tool is certainly set up in a way where you can have different establishment costs for different types of trees. But for the purpose of today, uh, we've set it up with $650 a tree. Um, 
The way the tool is also configured for this example here is the species mix. So you'll see we're going to refer to species mix A and species mix B. So species mix A has 30% there for small trees right through to 0% for large trees. Uh, whereas species mix B has a slightly different combination. What you'll see is it's got fewer of the smaller trees and some of that uh, growth in the trees is actually pushed back to the medium to large and the large trees. And a little bit of a spoiler alert, what you'll find is that even a small adjustment in preferencing larger trees, if they can be planted in any given area, really can have a pretty big impact on your ability to achieve future canopy cover targets. So um, just a little bit on the functionality of the light versus the professional version. So uh, the light version, you'll see that if we look at the range of different uh, areas of functionality of the tool of which I've identified um, eight here, the light version has uh, three different core parts of functionality. They're open and can be manipulated. And there are four um, options around canopy targets already set in there, which is the 30, 50, 60, and 70%. Whereas in the professional version, it's fully open. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to stop screen sharing on the presentation and we'll jump into the, the light version just to show you how uh, simple that is to get in there. Now, Jenny, I'll just double check with you. Can you see the, the online version there? Yep, thumbs up. So. Uh, if we come into the, the EDGE website here, basically enter in your details. This is always dangerous because my touch typing is, is not awesome. And then basically hit enter the tree planting predictor. Oh, there we go. So it only takes a couple of seconds to come in and this is what you're presented with. So. This is a cut down online light version of the tool that is freely available. One of the reasons we put this together is we've been having a lot of interest from community groups who are saying, look, we love the functionality of the tool. We like where it's going. We don't really need the full blown professional version, but we want to work with our community to start this conversation around how many trees we need to plant to reach our future targets. And so that's what uh, one of the reasons the light version has been put together. So as you'll see, any of these gold boxes an area that you can adjust, so you can put in the total area of your region, you can put in the current canopy cover, and then there are a range of different features here that are set. So you basically hit the calculate button, that crunches away to do the first stage calculation. It then shows you what the assumptions are around the types of trees that are already in your area. So that, that defines the tree growth parameters, drives the calculations in those 500,000 formulas. And then you can put in here, what's the total number of trees that you're looking at for your area? Come down and hit calculate. And then we come down the bottom and you'll see what it's done there is it's given us some projections and it's talking about what's our base canopy cover, what's the um, function or the growth of non-irrigated trees, and then what's the growth of irrigated trees. And it projects those canopies forward as they relate to different targets. So you remember here, we had our four future canopy cover targets and immediately this is giving insight. This was a real example whereby we can scroll down here and see that within 14 years under this scenario, we'd expect to reach our first target. Whereas it may take us some 41 years to reach our fourth target. So there's a lot of very rich information that's available here uh, that can be unpacked. So once again, this is a uh, a free version, a light version, it's available online and we're constantly looking at how to upgrade it and update it. And anyone using the light version is welcome to send us feedback. Uh, there's an email address up the top here. So feel free to send us feedback as to other functionality you've been looking for here, or in the case you find any bugs to send that through as well. So that's just a little bit on the, uh, the light version. I'm going to stop sharing that screen and then I'm going to flick over now to the, the full blind version, which is the professional version, just to give you a bit of a window into that. So um, I liken the light versions a bit like having a Corolla, a Toyota Corolla to go and um, go down the shops and buy a carton of milk. This is a bit more like having uh, probably the highway vehicle that can go at a nice speed and has all sorts of different functionality. So what you'll see is there's full flexibility in terms of the current scenario and how it's set up. With respect to targets, we've got functionality for setting up three targets here. 
uh, they can be defined in a range of different ways. Importantly, all the tree growth parameters can be tailored. So this is where we'd run those sessions with individual uh, organisations to work out, you know, what is the crown spread at the time of planting? How long does it take for a category B or C tree to get to maturity in your given location if it's not irrigated? And what's the crown spread at maturity? We then have it built within here, other parameters like success rate. Jenny mentioned earlier on, success rate is really significant and really quite important. And then we also have a series of scenarios that we roll out, uh, which let us play with the amount of trees that are being planted in different tenures. Uh, for those of you who, for example, in local government, you'll know this is really, really important. These councils increasingly are being expected to be the champions, driving increases in canopy cover. Any in reality, you often have one of the smaller amounts of land mass in any given area to work with. It's often the private sector or even uh, state government or regional government land uh, where there are great amounts of land available. And so these scenarios down the bottom here, they let us look at what happens if all the trees are planted in, for example, just council land versus what happens if we're able to split that planting across local, state and private land. Coming across the side here, we then have our series of graphs. This is what you saw earlier on on the light version, but basically we start to layer these up and provide multiple insights through running different scenarios. So sensitivity testing becomes really quite significant. And then down the right hand side here, we've got a further series of outputs, which looks at the breakout of different canopies as they relate to different scenarios. So if I just zoom out for a moment, the idea is that this is a single user dashboard. Um, and we've got a series of other tabs here in the professional version around the planting schedule. So we can look at setting a standard planting schedule for say 20 or 30 years, or you can look at if, for example, you thought we're going to get some funding in the next five years, we'll really ramp up our planting, but then we expect the planting to drop away, you can basically manipulate that as well. And there's a series of tabs around um, the different, uh, different rates of canicoo growth for different tenures. And then in the background behind here in some hidden sheets are all the different formulas that come together. So basically that's a little window into the, the results, also the way that the professional version is set up. What I'm going to do now is come back to the um, come back to the slides, and we'll jump back into regather our spot in the slide deck. Um, Mark, did you want to answer any questions as they come in or at the end? Um, I think I might hold on to the end, Jenny, mm -hmm. um, and we'll come to them at the end. So we've probably got about uh, ten minutes to go on this, and then happy to take all questions at the end. So. If we just have a look at the type of outputs we're getting, for example, um, this is the output for two and a half thousand trees per year under the scenario. And what you can see here for the city of Greenway, even if they were planting two and a half thousand trees per year, in the way the tool is configured with species mix A, they are never going to get even to 25% of canopy cover, let alone 30%, which is the line in the middle. But what about if they were to plant 5,000 trees per year? Well, in this case here, they have actually been able to reach their canopy cover target of, or a target of 25%, and the tool's projecting that they'll get there by 2053. Um, once again, and you can see where this is going, is you can start to run as many different scenarios as you want through the tool. This one here, we put in 7,500 trees per year, and all of a sudden we've come out with a 2044 timing as to when the um, when the target of 25% is met. What we tend to do is for reporting purposes, generate these different types of graphs, but this type of information here in this tabular form turns out to be very uh, powerful. So what we have here is consolidated information for what is multiple scenario runs through the tool. So you'll see down the side here, we've got two and a half a thousand trees planted per year, 5,000 and seven and a half thousand. We've then got our planting mix A and planting mix B, remembering that planting mix B has a higher, slightly higher proportion of larger trees. Uh, then we've got our canopy cover targets of 25, 30, and 35%. And what we're looking at is what's the cost of achieving those targets when you tally up the number of trees being planted per year with $650 per tree, and then the time over which uh, that planting needs to occur. Now, remembering some of these figures down the bottom, you might be looking at thinking that is huge, but in some cases here, we're looking at 
well over 30 years worth of planting. So on an annual basis, that might come out to a couple of million dollars. Key points to note here, for example, is that um, under our planting mix A, it's only when we get to 5,000 trees per year can they even achieve a 25% target. And under planting mix A, they only get 30%, which was what they really wanted to achieve when they're planting 7,500 trees per year. My guess is if I was sitting in that council, I'm probably gonna say, this just doesn't work for us. So what they might've done is to look at how they introduce larger trees into their planting mix. And you'll see that has a dramatic impact on the speed at which they can achieve a future canopy cover target. So in this case here with 5,000 trees, they couldn't achieve that target at all under planting mix A, but under planting mix B, they could get there by 2056. Um, if they wanted to plant 7,500 trees per year, they can get there by 2048. I won't unpack this data too much more because I know there are some questions starting to come through. Um, but uh, the bottom line here is that there are lots of different scenarios that you can run through, but it provides some deep insights into the time taken to get to those different um, canopy cover targets. The final point I'll just make before I hand back over to Jenny is the sensitivity testing becomes really, really significant. And Jenny will talk in a few moments around how we deliver this at times uh, through workshop process. And those workshops can be really valuable for the sensitivity testing. So what we tend to start to modify and tweak there is what are the number of trees per year? How sensitive are achieving your targets to that? We'll look at what the species mix might be or the cost per tree. Establishment success becomes really interesting because there then is a trade-off between do I invest in improving my establishment success or do I invest in planting more trees? Uh, obviously, assumptions around dieback become really significant as well as starting canopy. Uh, the last point I'll make in this slide is the tenure analysis also becomes really, really important because I think what particularly becomes apparent for some organisations is that uh, if you were to try and achieve everything uh, just by one organisation across, say, for example, a council area, then there's a lot of work to be done. And it's important to look at how you can actually uh, spread the load across multiple different stakeholders within a region. And so the sensitivity testing becomes important for that as well. Okay, so um, I might pause there, Jenny, and hand back over to you to start to bring us through the final stretch. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So, I mean, Mark's just run us through the, um, the process of how we would have done this sort of modelling for a hypothetical city, but this is just an example of a real world case study. Um, so for the city of Port Adelaide Enfield, which is um, one of the um, Adelaide metro cities, um, so we run this process with them and had some really interesting discussions and outputs and, and scenarios that we've run through with them. And the report for this, if you're interested in delving into it yourself in a little more detail, is publicly available. I'm putting that link just in the chat now that you can access it yourself. But basically, we modelled three different canopy cover targets for them and two different planting mixes, as we've shown in the hypothetical. The planting mix B included a higher proportion of larger canopy trees and planting mix A was um, more sort of um, biased towards your smaller canopy trees. And we found that the outputs from this showed that, you know, in order to achieve say a 20% increase, they could do that basically under any of the planting scenarios. But if they wanted to increase that to, you know, 35% or 70% target, then it really comes down to planting more trees or planting a higher proportion of larger canopy trees. And you can see even for a 70% increase, so their target three, even under planting mix B, which had the larger canopy trees, they're not likely to achieve that target um, if they're only planting a small number of trees. So that really comes down to planting more trees um, in that case. And what we can also see is um, for example, uh, the planting two and a half thousand trees under planting mix A will achieve a 20% increase by uh, 2058. But if you, uh, you know, increase that to seven and a half thousand trees a year, then you can achieve that same canopy cover increase uh, 20 years earlier. Um, so it had really significant implications for, for this council and, and it was really important for taking to their elected members this evidence base. Um, and as a result of this study, 
they were actually able to justify for substantial increase in funding um, towards their tree planting programs uh, to help achieve these kind of cover targets that council had already um, established. Um, and it also helped to um, bring on additional staff to help implement the tree planting program. So, so it was a really powerful study to just demonstrate how this evidence base can really influence um, that support and funding needed to achieve these targets. And I know there's a question um, that's come through around, you know, geez, it seems like a, a big budget to achieve a target and we've only got a small budget. Um, so this is perhaps an example of how this evidence base can really help to leverage the additional funding needed, particularly when a council has already committed to uh, achieving a certain canopy cover target. Um, so Mark, do you wanna jump onto the next slide? So to give you an idea then of how, you know, if you came to us and said, great, we'd love you to come and do a, a tree planting predictor project with us. This gives you an idea of how that project is implemented. So basically we would start off by doing a request for information to figure out how much of that input data, those seven sort of input data that we went through earlier, how much of that information do you currently have and what would we need to um, derive or, or help you sort of get together um, to start the, the modeling process. Um, there'd then be a, a first workshop, an initial workshop where we'd um, encourage inviting your key planning staff and horticultural or ARP team, your field officers, the people who really understand uh, what happens um, and what needs to happen to get trees in the ground and to manage them effectively. And this first workshop really provides an introduction to the tool, um, you know, to get people familiar with it and, and to build that confidence in the tool and how it's going to operate. Um, we also work with um, the workshop participants to customise the input data. So that's really talking about those tree growth parameters and understanding how different tree species um, grow in their particular local context and how irrigation affects that or not. Um, and then also we would work to define the specific planting program scenarios that you're interested in, in modeling. Um, so we would then go away and model those scenarios and then come back in a second workshop, ideally with the same people from the first workshop and do a review of those initial outputs. And it's then that we can really start tweaking some of these scenarios and, and refining them um, to, to really start getting some, some realistic outputs um, for you. Um, so we started off developing this tool mainly for, you know, local councils, for local land managers, because that's who we were hearing most of these questions from. And I guess somewhat surprisingly to us, but in a, in a very good way, when we launched the light version of the tool, we have started receiving a lot of interest from developers. Um, so local councils, for instance, may use the tool, you know, once every two or three years in, in helping to inform their tree planting programs. Um, developers though, are suggesting they might want to use the tool multiple times a year across multiple developments um, to inform their landscaping plans and, and you know, helping to achieve uh, canopy cover targets within developments. Um, there's also applications then with landscape architects, with nurseries. Um, so there's a really nice link there in terms of councils using this tool or, or developers even using the tool to say how many trees they will need you know, over the foreseeable future um, and what type of trees and using that information to communicate with the nursery so that that um, resource of trees is going to be available for them. Um, and there's also potential um, applications with community groups as well. So Mark, next one. Yeah, so one of the questions we've been getting asked ever since we uh, released the light version is, hang on, is this, uh, does this work against other tools? Does it work with them? Can it be used as part of a suite of tools? And our answer would be absolutely, it's part of uh, what can be applied as a suite of different tools. As far as we can tell, there really aren't too many tools out there that um, present this sort of opportunity to be able to project future canopy cover target and then look at issues like what the cost is. So it's absolutely complementary. The sort of ways that we see that it could be used, for example, is also with another tool we've developed called the Street Tree Prioritizer. This is an example of work that we've done for our council where effectively you're taking 
landscape scale analyses down to identify individual trees across an entire council area and plantable opportunities. You can generate maps such as this where you've got your priority areas for um, planting, which then goes into five year schedules for um, tree planting programs. But fundamentally what you're doing is using T, the tree planting predictor to look at how many trees need to be planted um, to reach a canopy cover target. And then something like a street tree prioritizer tells you where to plant them to get the best outcomes from a social vulnerability, urban heat and canopy perspective. So it can be used with that. Another example, some of you will be familiar with the Water Sensitive Cities Institute's uh, target tool, which is really an urban heat um, simulation tool being used or available for use in many cities around Australia. It has the ability to look at how you increase tree canopy cover um, in different parts of a landscape to achieve certain reductions in urban heat. What it doesn't do though, is to work out if you wanna to get to that canopy, how many trees you need to plant to get there, which is obviously something that uh, the tree planting predictor can do. A tree asset management system, there are clearly a growing number of tree asset databases. I think a great one that we're familiar with is forestry, which the team at forestry have done an awesome job at pulling that together. This is very much a tool, a tree planting predictor can help once again work out how many trees to plant up front. And then a tool like a forestry is a database knowing how do you actually better catch information around what's in the ground um, at any given point in time. And we also know about uh, which plant where, which has been developed with support from uh, Hort Innovation. Uh, our understanding is that's primarily around what's the ideal types of trees to plant. Once again, that we think works really nicely with something like tree planting predictor, which can then help to work out what's the future canopy size from that given planting regime. In terms of where to next, um, because of some of the interest we've been getting in the tool around multiple applications per year, and some interest has suggested that, that could be 30 or 40 times per year for one organisation, we're heading down the path of the software as a service uh, solution. Um, that's really interesting and exciting. So that's effectively would be a, a subscription-based model, which would sit alongside the existing way that the tool is being delivered. We're currently exploring how to build in carbon sequestration. So to not only project forward how many trees to plant and the canopy, but also provide insights as to how much additional carbon can be stored in that. Uh, we've also got work currently underway as to how we can expand the number of different categories of trees and longer term, how we might in, include species specific tree growth parameters. And uh, one final thing we're really excited about is within an Australian context, we're developing a national report at the moment, which at a high level will pro provide insights for capital cities as to how many trees they may need to plant to be able to meet future canopy cover targets. And that's really part of, from our perspective, we wanna really contribute to the active discussion that's happening in cities around Australia as to how do we uh, green up those areas. Um, just one final point before we go to Q&A, how to get involved. We're currently developing a series of case studies. Uh, we have a case study we're working through developing in New Zealand at the moment. So that's exciting, that's coming together. Um, we're looking for case studies though as well, other case studies in Australia, particularly in New South Wales and Victoria. And we're looking, when we look at a case study, it's not at a whole council area. Uh, the case study, which is something that uh, we'll do on the house, so to speak, it's really at a neighbourhood level. So something the scale of about a one square kilometre um, example. We're also later on today, we're running this presentation uh, for uh, people in the United Kingdom, in Europe and the United States. So we're also currently looking for case studies there. Um, and a little footnote here, if anyone is interested in that national report, which will focus on Australia, um, please feel free to send through your details uh, to the TPP at edgeenvironment.com email. So Jenny, that brings us towards the end. Um, how about, did you want to lead us away with one of the questions there uh, that we've got in the Q&A? Yep, so we've had a few questions come through. So Rachel um, from City of Campbelltown um, was asking about how we can factor in recent plantings that might not yet be captured um, in existing canopy cover um, figures. Um, so um, I guess my thought on that would be potentially we could um, start the modelling sort of a few years earlier. So when you did those plantings, and build those plantings into your first um, few years of, of um, planting programs so you know how many you've already planted and what the species mix is. So we build it in that way. Um, Mark, would you have another suggestion on how 
to tackle that. Uh, that's exactly how I would have done it. Mm. Yeah, so basically yeah. select the benchmark here where you start the, uh, the tool from and there's our energy efficiency coming in. Uh, as Select the, the benchmark here where you start from and then build in those first couple of years of additional planning. So spot on, Jenny. Yeah. Um, Felix has got a question about whether we factor in existing tree growth. Yeah, so the way that's done, and this is very much a landscape scale tool. So what we're looking at with current growth is Ideally, we would be comparing multiple canopy cover data sets uh, through time. So we want to understand what's the underlying trajectory of a change within, a, uh, within an area. So is it an area that's declining at the moment or is it an area that's growing? So that at a landscape scale is the way that we would tackle that. If you're looking at that question at a neighbourhood scale, I'd probably almost go to a different type of modelling approach. So, yeah, there's absolutely a way that we tackle that at a landscape scale. Yeah. Um, Peter Nichols has asked about that, that current budget versus the, the modelled um, budget need. So, you know, if it's coming out potentially $2 million a year to achieve a target and he's saying, you know, their council currently has a budget of $100,000, um, what's the funding model? Um, I've, hopefully partially answered the fact that this evidence base can actually help to leverage the additional funding needed. But Mark, do you have other comments on the funding model? Oh, look, Peter, I thought it was a brilliant, brilliant question. And I think uh, to me, that's one of the reasons why we developed this tool really was developed out of questions just like that and saying, how do we actually answer that? So, you know, to me, this is where you can start to run a few different scenarios. You might say, well, uh, for hundred thousand dollars a year, how many trees can we actually plant? Um, how do we perhaps get more bigger trees? So, you know, if you're spending hundred thousand dollars on crepe myrtles per year, which I, I'm sure you're not, but if that was the case, it's obviously going to you're not going to get a bigger as big a canopy cover as if you are planting, say, medium to large trees in parks and reserves. The other thing there is to be able to play around with this whole establishment cost question, which obviously becomes really quite significant. Um, we know that with some of the councils we've worked with in the past, that when they're doing street trees, they're in that $500 to $600 per tree range. However, some of them have also said, if we're out in our parks and reserves, we're effectively plant a tree and it's a set and forget strategy, or not perhaps forget, but it's a set it, uh, plant it, let it go. Your costs for establishment are going to be lower. And so using the tool, you can actually run multiple different scenarios to say, well, actually, how far can we make that $100,000 stretch? Um, so, um, yeah, $2 million a year, absolutely granted, is a lot. But this is the whole idea of the tool, is that if you've got elected members who are saying, uh, hey, Peter, we want to achieve 30% canopy cover in the future, and you're currently at 15, and they only want to give you $100,000 a year, this tool gives you the power and the evidence base to go back and say, hey, we need to rethink our strategy. Um, Gwilym's got a question. Gwilym's joining us from New South Wales. So um, regarding the irrigation versus non-irrigation um, part of the, the tool, um, basically how long does it assume the trees are irrigated for? Is it just during the establishment or the long term? Yeah, great, great question, Gwilym. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, look, the way we tackle that is we're ultimately looking at what the tree growth parameters are once the tree is, um, is fully mature. So in this case here, what we do is we say, well, if our irrigated scenario was actually first five years irrigated and then effectively removed the irrigation, we'd be working with the Hort teams or the arboriculturists to say, a tree growing under those conditions, how would its canopy, its mature canopy differ or the rate at which it gets there, how would that differ from a tree that never received irrigation? So that's really where the power of the customization and working with on-ground crews really comes in. Um, and then we've got one final question, I think. Oh, oh no, a couple more. Um, a question from Cameron from Banyol Council in Victoria. Um, so talking about the number of locations for trees being finite, unless you're going to cost in, you know, replacing sort of um, roads or footpaths, that sort of thing, retrofitting. Um, so can this model replacement of existing trees that underutilise their space? I would, yeah. That's a real street level question, Mark, isn't it? It is. I think, Cameron, uh, thanks for the question. It's a really interesting one. The way we would tackle this, once again, is looking at a landscape view, is we'd want to know how many trees that are um, perhaps underutilising this space, how many trees of that type are there? 
we then want to say, what's your current canopy? Um, if we remove all of those trees, how much canopy will you actually lose? We can factor that in then into the current rate of dieback or whether you've got a canopy cover that's actually growing or receding in the area. And then look at if you then went in and replanted them, how will it start to grow through time? Um, that's a good example as well where we combine a couple of different uh, techniques. So one of the things we haven't talked about much today is that we will work with a company called Airborne Logic who uses RGB imagery and machine learning to identify the canopy size of uh, individual trees. So what you do there is if you didn't have uh, the data from ground-based surveys, you could use spatial information to say, we've got a thousand trees here, their current canopy is X, and then we need to factor that into how the, what the current rate of change is. Uh, so there's absolutely a way to, to do it. As Jenny said as well, though, you'd probably, if you're doing this just today, if you wanted to do this street by street, you'd probably adopt a slightly different technique. Yeah. That we're very much focused on how to do this at a landscape scale. Um, and then we've got a final question from Alice Yates. Sorry, Alice, I'm not sure where you're joining us from. Um, but a really interesting question about potential other application use of the tool. Um, so potentially transferring it to guide um, oh, Alice from Oregon, from the US. Thanks for joining us, Alice. Um, to help guide restoration projects. So if you wanted, if you're trying to achieve certain uh, percent canopy cover to say provide shading or shade out invasive plants, um, could the tool be used to help predict the time until that cover is reached at various planting des des densities, which then could save on costs, which I think is a really interesting um, application of the tool and I think could definitely be used in that way. Um, Alice, thanks for the question. This is what excites me around having these discussions because this is one to get exactly how the tool came about and how we continue to evolve the versions is by uh, asking questions like this. So just thinking on my feet here, really what we'd want to do is to be able to say, um, and it's a little bit similar to the one of the previous questions. So would you be wanting to remove existing trees to then put in new trees that shade out invasives, or are you wanting to plant additional trees to then shade out invasives? So either way, um, my view would be, yes, you could, uh, you could achieve that. Um, what we'd want to know is what's the, the broad parameters of the types of trees that you want to plant. Um, and then it becomes a very similar discussion to what we've already covered. So um, yeah, great question. I think with the existing functionality and tool that could already be done, Alice. And uh, yeah, more than happy to have a chat about that um, after today as well. Um, Mark, we've got a question, a late, late emerging question, I think off the back of chatting about the street tree prioritizer, I think. Um, Peter Nichols is asking about um, what the resolution of the RGB is. Is it two and a half centimetres? Yeah, look, great, great question. Uh, two and a half centimetres would be ample. Um, the work around machine learning regularly blows my mind in terms of what's achievable with that. Uh, what we're currently looking at doing is Airborne Logic providing a specification around what data sets they need uh, to be able to run that analysis. So uh, Peter, my understanding based on that password is two and a half centimetres is more than ample. However, happy to uh, follow up with more, I suppose, specific information on that um, off the back of today, if you like. That's all the questions at the moment in the dying few minutes if there's any other urgent questions please put them in the q a or the chat box otherwise please do feel free to email us um, directly with your questions wonderful uh well i think that's it jenny look really appreciate everyone joining us today um we're really excited to be able to share with you where we've got to and i know i've said it a couple of times now but really this is this has been born out of discussions just like we've been having today uh, with uh, previously it was councils, now it's with councils and developers and communities, all sorts of different stakeholders. And we're really excited around where we've got to, but also where the tool is going to continue to grow in the future. So uh, if you do have any questions or feedback, by all means, feel free to uh, slot it through to that uh, tpp at edgeenvironment.com address. And Jenny and I would be happy to get back to you. Or if you're interested in being a case study. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Thanks, everyone. And uh, have a great day wherever you're coming to us from. Thanks, everyone.